Dear guests, uh, we are starting our uh, webinar, uh, session of energy transition uh, webinars, which we plan for, the, for this and the next uh, week. Uh, as many of us, of, of you remember, in January 2020. Dear guests, uh, we are starting our uh, webinar, uh, session of energy transition uh, webinars, which we plan for, the, for this and Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, we had we had a very good session in Davos in January 2020, and and uh, Mr. Leonard presented his speech, which uh, was uh, of great interest for for all participants on energy transition, uh, uh, pollutions, and, and stakeholder stakeholders engagement in energy transition. Now we have a slightly changed reality. As uh, one of my uh, colleagues said, uh, it's kind of time machine. Things which we expected in 2030 happened now in 2020. So I think now we have to reconsider uh, certain things in terms of timing, in terms of importance. And, and, and now, today, we start our uh, energy transition uh, sessions with a message from uh, Ray Leonard. Uh, Mr. Leonard, uh, the floor is yours, uh, please present uh, your update on, on, uh, uh, on energy transition and, and energy's future. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, thank you for the invitation from, from Caspian Week, um, which is a, um, an arm of the World Economic Forum. And it was almost exactly six months ago that I presented at Davos on um, on climate change and um, and its effect on energy's future. And now six months later, and it seems like more than six months actually when you think about it, we need to put a third element into the discussion, climate change, COVID-19, and the combination of its effect on, on energy's future. Um, what I'll do in this presentation is really address three different points. Um, first of all, what was the status of climate change in January 19, um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, just briefly summarizing the, the key points that I made at the Davos presentation in January. Then talk about how COVID-19 is affecting the world economy and energy use and climate change. And there are actually some surprising things that, that can be pointed out. And then talk about what will be the longer term effects of COVID-19 um, on climate change. And we truly are at a, an inflection point in which we can go in several different directions, which will have a very significant effect on, um, on our economic future and on mankind's future. So first of all, just to summarize the status of, of climate change, um, the global temperatures are tied very much to the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and the, the primary greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, 80% um, of which emissions are, are associated with the burning of, of fossil fuels. Um, the CO2 um, level of, in, in the atmosphere has increased by 100 parts per million just since 1960. And, and the rate is actually accelerating from one part per million in the period of 1960 to 1980, up to three parts per million just in this past decade of 2010 until the present. So it's happening faster and faster. And we can actually measure how high CO2 was in, in geologic history from the fossil and the geochemical record. For example, it was about 800 parts per million about 30 or 40 million years ago at a time when the earth was much, much warmer. Um, during the ice ages, it was down to about 200 parts per million. And this chart just shows, and it's in a logarithmic scale, so each of the sections are, are in a different time frame. But, but we're moving very rapidly. We've gone from 280 parts per million to over 400 parts per million in just a matter of, of a, little over, um, a little over 100 years. Now, there actually is a second very important greenhouse gas, methane, which molecule for molecule is much more powerful than, than CO2. And it's actually increasing at about double the rate of, of carbon dioxide. 
Um, now, the methane emissions had flattened at the beginning of this century, but since 2008, they've, they've taken off again at a much higher rate. Um, fossil fuels contribute about a third of methane emissions, and oil and gas has increased just in the past decade from 20 to 24 percent of, um, of that total amount. Now, the, the satellite imagery um, shows that um, it kind of explains that because it, it shows the, the, the red, the green and the red areas show the high methane emissions. And very clearly it shows that those high methane emission areas are the areas where you have high oil and gas production. Uh, the map of the United States shows that um, the extremely high areas are very closely associated with the areas where you have the, um, the fracking production. Um, the, um, the picture on the, the lower right is from an, an air um, study um, that's it's much more in, in detail. And it shows that up to 50% of the emissions come from super emission sources. Uh, a study um, that was presented in, in science in 2018 shows that independent estimates show that methane emissions are almost double the amount of the self-reported emissions by, um, uh, by, by the oil and gas operators. And a key point here that we'll come back to later is that the discussion of using natural gas as a transition fuel doesn't make any sense unless you can somehow do something about the methane emissions. Now, there are other factors that play a role in temperature that have nothing to do with the, um, the fossil fuel industry. And that is the variation in solar intensity and the ocean currents. And this slide just summarizes those. Um, the, the solar emissions, uh, the solar, um, uh, the solar radiation goes at 11 year cycles and the highs and the lows are shown on this chart. Um, and that causes a variation in temperature taking everything else into account of about 0.2 to 0.25 degrees centigrade. Um, and the last peak in solar radiation was about 2015. We're at a minimum right now. We're gonna be at a maximum again in 2024 or 2025. Um, the other factor is the ocean currents, and the El Nino current is associated with much warmer temperatures. And as the ocean is warming, the El Ninos are getting stronger. And as a matter of fact, the three strongest El Ninos ever recorded were recorded within the last 40 years. Um, and in 2016, you happen to have the strongest El Nino ever recorded at the same time you were near a solar maximum. And so what was the result? 2016 was the warmest temperature year ever recorded. It not only broke the record, it broke the record by almost half a degree centigrade. And what we're going to face in, in this coming decade is if you have a strong El Nino at the time of a solar maximum, you're probably going to break the record by another half degree. So we're looking at sometime in the next five years of an extremely, extremely hot year. And that possibly is going to be the next um, climate disaster year. Now, the correlation between CO2 and temperature in the past 50 years is, is very obvious, um, as can be seen. And it really has taken off since 1980 in, in a large way. Um, in terms of the different types of fossil fuels, as you can see, it, it really since the end of the Second World War that the amount of fossil fuel global emissions has, has taken off. And of the different types of fossil fuels, coal is almost half of the amount of fossil fuel emissions, oil about a third, and natural gas just below um, 20%. And what's also interesting to see is coal emissions increased 60% in just 10 years from 2002 to, um, to, to 2012. Now, as, as you saw before, the, the significant temperature increase began about 1980. And what's interesting is it didn't begin in a um, consistent fashion um, around the world. The land averages have increased at about double the rate of the ocean, so that the land averages are actually up to almost two degrees centigrade, whereas the ocean is a little less than one degree. Um, and the temperatures in the Arctic have actually increased um, about 50% higher than the land. So they've increased almost three degrees um, centigrade. 
Now, in a, in a very short amount of time, that's had a dramatic impact on the North Polar region. And as the, the figure on your upper right shows that just between 1985 and 2017, the Arctic lost 70% of its multi-year ice. Um, and the only multi-year ice left really is, is, a, is a trend just along the northern coast of the Canadian Arctic Islands and northern Greenland. The rest is, the rest is single year ice, which means it melts every, every summer. And not surprisingly, the amount of area covered by September, which is the, the time of minimum ice, has reduced by 50% in, in just that same period, which means by midsummer, the Arctic will be virtually ice free, except for that thin skim of ice along the northern edge of Greenland and the Canadian Arctic islands. Now, since 2000, we've had something called cascading effects or compound events where different aspects have started to combine to accelerate the entire um, process. Um, one thing is that as you have warming, you have less snow cover. And snow, of course, the, with, the, uh, with the white is reflects sunlight, whereas the dark land absorbs sunlight. And so with less snow cover, you're getting um, more absorption of heat. And 2012, for example, which was a particularly warm year in the Arctic, it just shows the reduction in, in the amount of, of snow cover. Another factor is the melting of the permafrost. Now, um, methane accumulates under the permafrost. And as the permafrost melts, you're getting massive emissions of, of methane. And since two, just since 2000, 15% of the permafrost is melted. By 2030, um, it's going to be another 25%. Um, and by this century, you're going to have more than um, half of the permafrost melting with massive amounts of methane emissions. Another factor is that as the oceans are warming, just the way the currents run, um, a significant disproportionate amount of the heat reaches the southern oceans. And as we'll see later, um, much of Antarctica really is not land, but it's an ice sheet. And what's happening is these warm southern ocean currents are undermining the ice sheets of, um, of Antarctica, which has very strong implications for eventual sea level rise. Now, as these compound events happen, we're moving closer and closer toward what's called a tipping point, which is where you go from a steadily increasing effect of climate change to a major acceleration of climate change. Now, there are a number of different possibilities for, for what this acceleration could mean. Um, Four very, the four most likely are change in ocean circulation patterns, breaking off of a major ice sheet, which will accelerate um, sea level rise, breaking down of the northern jet stream, which will change the, um, the, the weather patterns in the northern hemisphere, or breaking down of the marine ecosystem, disrupting the food supply. Now, all of these have happened in the geologic past, and, and we can demonstrate them. Um, it's, um, this isn't a major portion of the presentation, so I'll only talk about one of the four, and that's the tipping point of a West Antarctic ice sheet breaking off. Um, West Antarctica has been rise, has been warming at four times the rate of, of the planet temperature rise, largely due to the warming of the Southern Ocean currents. And as I've mentioned before, West Antarctica is mostly ice. There's only a small part of land there and it's being rapidly undermined by the Southern Ocean currents. Now, what happens when a major portion of, of the Antarctic ice sheet breaks off? Well, we can look at that's exactly what's happened about 14,000 years ago. And it's called meltwater pulse, uh, pulse 1A, in which a major piece of the West Antarctic ice sheet broke off. And we can estimate that at that point in time, in, in, in a period of only several centuries, sea level rose by 30 meters at a rate of somewhere between 26 and 53 millimeters per year, depending on the various calculations, or averaging about 40 millimeters per year, which is 10 times the current rate of sea level rise. Now, 40 millimeters per year is one meter every 25 years. So if this happens, and this is becoming more and more a real possibility, we could see an order of magnitude sea level rise. This is not fantasy from one half. A Hollywood movie. This is something that really could happen. So that's the state of climate change as we see it right now. Now, 
an important point that should be kept in mind later is that CO2 emissions vary substantially for different fossil types, fossil fuel types. It's the highest for coal and it's the lowest for natural gas. And for oil, there's a continuum depending on the type of oil, ranging from extra heavy oil, such as the tar sands in, in, um, in Alberta, which is almost the same as coal, or light oils, um, it's not that different than that than natural gas. Um, one important point also to make is if you flare um, the associated gas from oil, even, even light oil, um, the, the emission level is almost the same as, as coal or is about the same as, as extra heavy oil. Now, another important point is how is the oil and gas industry responding to the climate change challenge? And there are a couple of ways of measuring this. How much financial resources they put into low carbon technologies? Um, are they shifting to lower greenhouse gas emission hydrocarbons such as we've seen in the previous slide? And are they making efforts to reduce their natural gas flaring and, and venting? On the first point, unfortunately, industry is spending less than 1% of capital investment in low carbon projects. And despite some high profile projects, this really hasn't changed very much. In other words, in the past five years, this amount has only gone from 0.5% to 0.8%. Now, if you take a look at different companies, there are some companies that are making more efforts than others. For example, Total is spending about 4%, 4 BP is spending about 2%, but almost every company is spending less than 1%. So they're really only dipping their toe in the waters in terms of this, um, in this effort. In terms of carbon emissions, um, this slide shows um, the amount of carbon emissions um, from their hydrocarbon production using, um, and then going back to the, the previous slide that I showed, um, synthetic or extra heavy oil at 1.8, conventional at 1.4, ultralight at 1.2, and natural gas at 1.0. And what it shows is the US majors, Exxon, Mobil, and Chevron at the highest level, although Chevron is beginning to drop, and the European majors for the most point at a much lower level. Um, one point to show is, is that Chevron is, is really and Equinor stat oil are, are rapidly dropping their um, uh, are, are rapidly dropping their numbers. Now, in terms of gas flaring, um, the actually that's happening at an epidemic level. The world flared almost 150 billion cubic meters of gas in 2018, the last year that you've got full records. That's equal to the entire amount of gas consumption of Africa, or 90% of the gas consumption of South America. And almost half of the gas flaring is in just four countries. Now in the United States, the amount actually increased by 15% in 2019 and virtually all the flaring was in just two basins, the Permian Basin and the Williston Basin. And as you could see from an earlier slide, the highest methane emissions are also associated with areas of high gas flaring. Now, again, this is not consistent across the board with all the companies flaring the same amount. As a matter of fact, in the Permian Basin, which is the, the worst of the basins, um, some companies such as Chevron and ConocoPhillips flare less than 1% of the gas that they produce, whereas other companies, BP um, is 14%, ExxonMobil is 6%, but because they have the highest gas production level, they're flaring the most, um, the most amount of gas. Now, in 2019, with the COVID-19 and, and the collapse of oil price, the amount of flaring is beginning to drop. Now, is that temporary because of the current price or is that a permanent change? We'll, we'll just um, have to see, but, but this is a major, major problem. Now, associated with this, the oil industry's perceived failure to address climate change and poor prospects in the low carbon world is causing institutional investors to divest from their stock. Um, the slide here shows the percentage of institutional investors owning the stock. And it, it's the state oil companies such as PetroChina and Rosneft that, that don't have institutional investors. The publicly owned companies have a high percentage. And as you can see on the upper right, that, that just in the last, um, last two years, um, 
the major um, institutional investors by an increasing margin are selling their shares of the, of the majors. Um, so what have the majors been doing? They've been um, buying back their shares, giving higher dividends to, to try to hold on to um, the institutional investors. And what's happening in 2020 with the collapse in oil prices is really putting a stress on that strategy. In other words, they don't have the cash to do that now. So what will be their response? We'll, we'll see, because that old strategy isn't working. Um, will this force them to change their strategies? Now we come to the Paris Climate Accord, which is supposedly the, uh, the answer to how the world is addressing this problem. And the problem is it's not a very good answer. Um, it is flawed and it's been ineffective. It allows a 20% increase in CO2 emissions. You have no mechanism for reduction. The targets only apply to emissions within countries that don't um, apply to their exports. There are no penalties for failure. And it really doesn't, emit, it doesn't um, address methane emissions, were, which are increasingly as, as important as CO2 emissions. Now, um, following the signature in 2016, the greenhouse gas emissions actually started rising again. And many of the key nations aren't complying with targets. And if we continue on this pace, um, we're going to have more than a 3% or a 3 degree increase. And so as it stands now, the Paris Climate Accord is not a, not a solution. I'd like to turn now to the COVID-19 pandemic. And for this, I would like to thank the Baylor College of Medicine who have acted as consultants to help me put together this portion of the presentation because obviously I am not a, um, an expert on this subject. Um, the um, pandemic obviously started in China, moved to Europe, then to the Americas, and now has moved to the developing world of South Asia and Africa. Um, it's moving so fast that just in the past week, we're now over 13 million cases. We're coming close to a quarter of a million cases per day, although the death rate is staying fairly steady at 5,000 um, deaths per day. And we know what the keys are to control this outbreak. They're actually the same keys that people figured out a, a, a century ago with the, um, with the Spanish flu, so-called Spanish flu outbreak social distancing, masks, good hygiene, testing, and contract tracing. Regarding the fatalities, the, the key is that COVID-19 attacks weaker immune systems. Older individuals and those with compromised health are more vulnerable. However, more effective treatments are gradually lowering the death rate. What are those more effective treatments? convalescent serum, antibodies that are recovered from the COVID-19 patients. And the limitation obviously is the amount um, of um, serum that's available. However, the cloning of antibodies from recovered patient, patients will be a key to future treatments. Now we are finding various medications that, that are helping. Um, the best known now is remdesivir. Um, there are other steroids. And these are gradually reducing the, um, the death rates. Will there be a second wave in, in, the, um, in the latter part of 2020? In all likelihood, yes. Every pandemic since 1900 has had multiple waves. Um, the Spanish flu, the Asian flu from 1957 to 1958, the Hong Kong flu in 1968 to 69, and the swine flu in 2009. So there will be another wave in the latter part of 2020. And so how are we gonna handle it? Some countries have fared better than others and this will be a key to how they fare until an effective vaccine is developed and administered. And you can really put countries into four categories. There are some countries that, affect, that adopted the correct policies from the start. They learned the lesson of past um, epidemics um, and they've avoided major outbreaks. Um, there are some countries that were in the early epicenters that learned from the experience, and they have a good chance of minimizing the effect of the second wave. Um, there are some countries that were away from the initial epicenters that did not, however, adopt the correct policies and are now experiencing major outbreaks. This is in Latin America and the developing world. 
Um, and there is one country, the USA, that experienced an early epicenter and did not learn and adapt and is getting the best of both worlds because it is experiencing a second peak even before the second wave. Now, a real recovery is likely only to happen with an effective vaccine. And the race to find an effective vaccine is on. Um, it's a worldwide search and money is no object. And the good news here is that real progress is being made. Um, uh, more than 125 vaccines have been developed in the laboratory um, and they're moving now to the clinical trials. Um, 15 vaccines are in the phase one trial um, where they're being tested safely for the dosage. Um, 11 have reached the phase two, which is an expanded trials and three are actually have started the large scale efficiency test, which hopefully will be completed by, um, by year end. Now, once that ends, you then get into the large scale production and distribution and administration. And that's likely to happen over the course of 2021. And there actually are five types of vaccines that have reached the stage of clinical trials. trials. So we're not putting all our, our, our eggs in one basket. We're trying a number of different ones and it's very po possible that we'll have more than one type of um, vaccine. And given the fact that this is gonna have to be distributed worldwide, that's, that's probably a good thing. Um, we have genetic vaccines, viral vector vaccines, whole virus vaccines, protein-based vi virus vaccines and repurposed vaccines. So it's very, very likely that we will have a vaccine during the course of, of 2021. Um, but it'll be during the course of 2021. We're not going to have one during the during 2020. So this comes to what is the global response to COVID-19 from an economic standpoint. Um, the hope at the beginning was what we call the single hit scenario. Um, it's had a devastating impact where the global activity has, has fallen um, by more than 10% um, in the second quarter of, of um, 2020 with living standards falling. And the hope was that we would have a rapid recovery in the second half of, of 2020. And that by the end of, of 2021, we would get back to where we were um, in terms of global GDP um, in January of, um, of 2020. Now, there's a double hit scenario, and that is if in the second wave, there's a new trigger of infections, which would push the, um, uh, the, the world economics back down again in Q4 2020, which would really delay the, um, the economic recovery through 2021. And you really would not get back to the point of the world's um, the GDP until sometime um, in, um, in mid to late 20, um, 2022. And unfortunately, with the increased rate of CO2, uh, of COVID-19 cases um, that we're getting right now, and the, um, and the second hit of increased cases in, in the US, um, the single hit scenario looks less and less likely. And what we're probably looking at is a hybrid somewhere between the, um, the two cases. Uh, unfortunately, the, the single hit scenario looks, um, looks less and less likely. Now, what's interesting is that in terms of energy use, it's not consistent across the board. Um, the reduction in use of coal and oil has been significantly greater than the reduction in gas um, which has been greater than the reduction in use of nuclear and the rest, uh, amount of renewables is actually energy use has increased during this time. Total energy demand is reduced by, by 6%. Um, and what's also interesting is that the energy use in the developed economies, Japan, the US and the EU has been about double the reduction in the developing world and the, um, and the emerging economies such as China, India, and Southeast Asia. So the average has been about 9% in the developed OECD world and about 4% in the um, emerging and, um, and the developing world. And the differential between coal and oil reduction has been even more marked in, in the two. Now, this is the single hit scenario 
and we're only beginning to start to recalibrate for something that's a hybrid between the single and the double hit. Now, as you saw much earlier, when I talked about climate change and the fact that coal was almost 50% of CO2 emissions, it's important to point out that 75% of the world's production consumption export of coal is in, the, um, is in the Eastern Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere to the east of, of the EU. And the diagram on the left-hand side of the slide shows that this is gonna be even more and more in the future because that big red bar shows the 2025 to 2040 um, plan of new coal plants under construction. The black bar shows the potential closures. And so this 75% is gonna to go to 75 to 80 to 90%. So the, the um, the discussion of coal use, which is the most important factor in greenhouse gas emissions right now, is largely out of the hands of the USA and EAU. And the fact that, um, as Dimitri mentioned at the beginning, is that in some aspects, we're moving from 2020 to 2030, just, just in one year due to the effects of COVID, is emphasized here. Um, you know, one, one important way of showing that is in China, which, reduced its coal consumption um, as it, it the, um, at the beginning of the pandemic is within, um, within a period of about six weeks, it was just about back to where it was before the pandemic. In other words, it was very limited, the amount of coal reduction time that, that it had. The other important factor is China had been um, artificially keeping its coal price high to help um, push the, the, the change to, um, to lower greenhouse gas fuels. And what has it done now? It's allowed the, coal, the price of coal to drop to, um, uh, to allow it to come back. In other words, China is emphasizing moving back economically as fast as it can from the, um, uh, from the reduction in economic activity during January and February. And in fact, in March, it approved more new coal plants in, 20, in, in 2020 March than it had in all of 2019. So it's, it, its priority is, is moving back economically as fast as it can. On the other hand, U.S. coal production is plummeting. Um, in, um, by May of, um, of this year, coal production was only half of what it had been in just a year earlier. In Germany, Europe's largest coal consumer, it had a decrease from 35 to 18% in the coal share of generated electricity. So the EU and the Europe is, is moving at accelerated speed to go out of coal. Now, from a greenhouse gas perspective, that, that's very good. However, you have to understand that the US and the EU are only 12% of global coal use. So in 2019, so that reduction has a limited impact. So let's talk about how the pandemics affected oil supply and demand, because that's the other fossil fuel that has been strongly affected by the pandemic. Um, as a transportation fuel, obviously lockdown has that effect. Oil demand um, dropped by more than 20% in, in the second quarter. And as a result, there was a huge imbalance of supply and demand and more than half a billion barrels of oil went into supply. The oil price collapsed. Now, the Asian nations, the major oil importers, China, India, Japan, and South Korea took advantage of this and actually kept their level of import steady, even though the demand had, um, had collapsed, to completely fill up their storages. And, and what this will do is keep the price depressed for a long time because they'll be able to, to gradually use that, uh, that inventory. Now, by reducing their, um, um, reducing their production by about 10 million barrels a day, OPEC and OPEC plus, they have um, come closer to restore the supply and demand and, and allowed a price recovery to about $40 per barrel by, um, by June. Um, however, um, Demand for gasoline has not yet recovered despite the gradual reopening. Um, and the best guess is that global demand is unlikely to reach its January 2020 level, at least by the end of 2021. 
Um, and the estimation is that in order to um, get rid of that excess um, inventory, you're going to have to have an overproduction of a million, uh, excuse me, an underproduction of a million and a half barrels per day deficit through 2023 to get rid of it. So we're looking at potentially low prices for, um, uh, for quite a large uh, amount of time. Now, the other point is that the amount of investment is severely reduced in, in upstream by about, they estimated by about 30% um, in, um, in 2020 and 21. And that investment is not across the board. It's, it's, the drop is much higher in the higher price oils, such as oil sands and, and shale oil, which is about 50%, and lower in, in offshore and conventional onshore. Now, the most reliable indicator of oil oil demand has been world GDP. And one thing we'll be looking at is over the next two or three years, if world GDP recovers and oil demand not as much, you'll see a fundamental difference in terms of how oil is, is being used in, in the world. Now, what about gas supply and demand? Um, gas demand has dropped only about half as much as oil demand, but it still has dropped. And as a result, gas prices worldwide have dropped, particularly in LNG, where the price has dropped down to about $2 per MMBTU, which is actually a parity with, um, parity with um, US natural gas prices. Now, the break-even price for LNG at facilities that are already existing are about $3. So this is a money-losing enterprise right now, which, which is not sustainable in, in the long term. Um, in the U.S., on the other hand, the gas prices stayed reasonably steady at about $1.70 um, or $1.80. It's, it's had drops, but it, it's come back to that level. And that's because about a third of U.S. shale gas production is associated gas with oil production. And as the oil production has dropped, um, the amount of associated gas has dropped to the point where it's envisioned that there's actually going to be a bit of a gas shortage next year and the prices the futures price is, is $2.40 for, for May 2021. And in Appalachia, in the Northeast US, the break-even gas price is, is, is slightly less than $2. So the US gas market is still, um, at least in, in the Appalachian area, is still, is still in reasonable shape. Now, with the reduction in um, in transportation, um, there actually have been environmental benefits of fossil fuel use. The reduction in use of coal um, and, and oil in China, for example, um, you showed a, a dramatic reduction in pollution um, from January to February in, in northeastern China. But unfortunately, as we've seen in an earlier slide, as, as it ramped up again, the pollution went right back up again very quickly. Um, in, um, in, in India, um, you could see a dramatic improvement in air quality in Delhi, for example. Um, you could see the Himalayas from Punjab, um, London, um, the clean air, you can see from that slide. And the air pollution in the Northeast US and in the um, urban centers of, of Europe um, dramatically improved. But as you could see from the example in China, once things get back to normal, the air pollution will very quickly um, get back, so it, it's, um, it's very limited. Now, looking at it from a worldwide um, perspective, um, major economic events in the world have actually had an effect on worldwide CO2 emissions. The Great Depression, for example, dropped CO2 emissions by about 25%, or about 1.5 gigatons in, in around 1930. The oil price shock around 1980 had a slight reduction in, in, GO2, in CO2 emissions. And actually, even before the, the COVID, um, the shift from um, uh, coal to natural gas in, in the EU and the US, um, plus the growth of renewables had started to flatten the curve. But the reduction in, um, in um, energy use in, in 2020 is reducing CO2 emissions by 8%, which is the biggest single drop um, ever, ever experienced. And the question is whether this is sustainable. So how has this affected climate change um, in, in the bigger picture? Well, 
The answer is it hasn't. This is a much bigger, um, bigger process. The amount of CO2 emissions um, through um, the first half of, of 2020, um, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere increased by three parts per million, just as, as predicted. Um, the spring in the world, uh, March to May of 2020, was the warmest three-month period ever recorded. Um, and um, the month of June was tied for the warmest um, ever recorded. So climate change in the bigger scheme of things is, is moving on just as, as, it, as it has before. So let's get back to the, the energy use. Why has renewables increased while everything else is dropping? Well, renewables are favored over nuclear gas and coal due to environmental factors. There was major investments in 2019 in, in renewable capacity, which came online in 2020. And renewables are easier to operate during lockdowns. And, and also lockdowns affected transportation more than electricity. So what do we have to do in, in the future to continue this? Um, we need more investment. We need more um, storage capacity. And the big question is, in an, a, a stressed economic situation, how important is it going to be um, for, um, for a better environment and addressing climate change? So what is likely to happen in 2020 from the standpoint of investment? Our best guess now is investment in total energy is likely to drop by 2020. The percentage of that for clean energy and energy efficiency is gonna increase from a share of 33% to 37%. However, if you take into account the total pop, pop, pot dropping, the actual amount of, um, of of investment in energy efficiency and clean energy is actually going to drop by, um, by something a little less than 10%. So in the larger scheme of things, we're, we're actually moving, moving backwards. Now I've talked about all the bad things that can happen, but, but there are a few technologies that'll help pull us out of this if, if we put enough emphasis on it. And I'd just like to briefly mention four of them. One is carbon capture use from sequestration. And the reason this is so important is it can not only reduce the amount of CO2 emitted, it can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The technology is required and what we need is economic justification. And this is where the oil and gas industry can play a leading role because they're the ones that can put the CO2 back in the subsurface better than anybody else. And the key for making this economic, I believe, is going to be a carbon tax. The next one is nuclear power. Nuclear power has consistently supplied 10% of electrical power, but established technology has been overtaken by renewables on gas, um, uh, by, by renewables to gas on price and safety issues. However, there is a new generation of nuclear plants that's been developed with higher efficiency, improved safety factors, floating nuclear plants, heavy water, high temperature, and small modular reactors that, that really challenge the preconceptions. In other words, people who are really saying nuclear is not the answer are really talking about the last generation of nuclear plants and not the ones coming up. And the key, I believe, for nuclear competitiveness is going to be a carbon tax. Another key is hydrogen. Now, hydrogen has the highest energy content by weight of any chemical fuel, three times that of gasoline, for example, and, and is a critical feedstock for chemical industry and power fuel cells. And, and the key for power fuel cells, it has little or no emissions. Now it needs energy for extraction. And in the end of the day, it may be best paired with, with nuclear. The two may work together. And the other plus is it could utilize gas in infrastructure for distribution. And the technology is known it's now a matter of economics for large scale use. You're gonna probably have to cut the costs of, of, its, um, of the energy for extraction probably by, by to about a third before it becomes, um, uh, it, it becomes competitive. But, but this can be done and this is one of the, the key answers. And the last point is recycling. The world generates about 2 billion tons of waste annually and only 13.5% is recycled. And, and one example of this is petrochemicals, which 
is the fastest growing use of oil and gas, and most plastics are not recycled. And again, this is not um, consistent across the board. Only 9% are recycled in the US, 25% in China, and 30% in the EU. Economic incentives for recycling would reduce a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions by reducing the amount of oil and gas needed for petrochemicals. This again is something that, that really can be done. So we come to the final part of the presentation, which is what is the future for energy taking into account this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, we've talked about the e economic scenarios, um, recovery with the single hit, which is a rapid economic um, recovery in 2020, and a second wave pushing the world into deep recession, delaying the economic recovery until 2022. And I believe what's coming out is something that's a hybrid, kind of halfway between the two, based on the fact that some of the world appears to have learned the lessons, um, such as, as the Far East and, and the EU, and some areas, which is the um, South Asia and, um, and Latin America and the USA that, that are looking more at the second wave scenario. So it's going to be a hybrid. And there are three paths. One is going back to the way um, the world was using energy prior to the pandemic, um, which is a, an increase in CO2 emissions of, of one and a half to 2% increase annually. Um, the second is a revert to the trend of the earlier part of this decade, which is flattening the amount of, of CO2 emissions um, by a transition to lower um, greenhouse gas hydrocarbons. Or third is actually reducing CO2 emissions and moving to a lower carbon economy. Um, the key to predicting the energy path will be how the pandemic goes, the shift in energy use, and the level of cooperation. Now, what happens if we go back to the way we were just before the pandemic? Um, basically, that means that by, um, by 2022 or 2023, we get back to where we were in CO2 emissions, and we start increasing CO2 emissions by about half a gigaton per year. It means that the EU and the US continue to decline in using coal and replacing it with natural gas, but China and the developing world continue to increase coal. Um, coal use. There's no new coordinated global initiative. Major firms continue to use one or two percent of capital spending on green initiatives and, and most of the, for the most part keep developing their oil and gas resources. Um, the status of pandemic and treatment, um, this is more likely in a poor economic scenario for the world where the emphasis on fast is economic recovery. It basically means keep using energy the way it was and international cooperation is lacking. So what does this mean? Temperatures keep rising at the pace that they're rising. Um, we hit one and a half degrees centigrade increase by the next decade. We hit two degrees increase by, um, by around 2060. And we likely are going to reach a tipping, one of those tipping points that I mentioned somewhere in the second half of this um, scenario. Um, uh, oil demand recovers and continues to increase at 1% per, per year, over 100 million barrels per day. Um, the loss of associated gas from fracking means the price of LNG will go back up, which will slow the replacement of, of LNG for coal in, um, in Asia. And actually, um, the um, economic growth in, in Asia will increase accelerate the shift of world economic power to, um, to the east. So the second possibility is freezing for now the level of CO2 emissions. And what this means is the EU and the US accelerate their um, shift away from, from coal at, at the rate that they're doing it right now. China would flatten its CO2 emission level and its Belt and Road instead of funding the world's coal plants, will start funding their clean energy projects. Um, low LNG costs will be subsidized to help China and India and the Far East shift from coal to natural gas. Capital spending in the majors will shift um, to low carbon projects and, and there'll be a significant reduction in flaring and methane emissions. Um, 
This is more likely to happen if the world economic recovery is in a better position to address environmental concerns. Um, this is probably the best opportunity for the oil and gas industry to play a positive role in climate change. But a key point is in unless you address methane emissions, the gas transition is not effective. Um, you're gonna have to have some international cooperation with the Paris Accord amended and major gas producing nations such as the US, Russia and Australia may actually recognize self-interest in this scenario. So what does this mean in terms of fossil fuels? It means that oil demand will have reached its peak in 2019. Gas production will be increasing at 4% per year by 2040 and coal production will be dropping at 2.5% per year. And so CO2 emissions will flatten and then to begin to, re to reduce after 2040. And we'll actually, after 2025, begin to see a, a reduction in the amount of, of um, temperature increase so that we can hope for a, um, a, a limitation to a 2.5% um, temperature degree increase. And we may be able to avoid a tipping point. The other possibility is actually taking the 8% um, the reduction in CO2 emissions, holding on to it, um, and then begin to make a massive shift to a lower carbon um, economy. Um, we can't use this, the, the Paris Climate Accord because it doesn't do the job. You're gonna have to negotiate a new climate accord in 2021 with two key provisions, a carbon tax and a ban on construction on new coal power plants. Um, US, USA, Europe, Japan, and Korea phase out coal power by 2030. China and India need to play a major role in this, freezing emission levels. Um, you need subsidies to support renewable replacement of coal power in developing nations with gas um, and LNG as a temporary substitute and a major shift in capital spending to renewables, carbon capture, nuclear and hydrocarbon initiatives and hydrogen initiatives. The three fundamental questions, you're more likely to have this if, if um, there's a better economic recovery, just because it's easier to focus on environmental conditions when your economy is better. It's a massive shift in energy use, and this scenario can only take place with drastically improved international cooperation. And speaking frankly, you're gonna have to have leadership change in several key nations or to reverse their views on climate change. Um, you're gonna to have to negotiate a new climate treaty in 2021 with a number of key provisions, a carbon tax incentivizing rapid use to renewables, hydrocarbon and nuclear, a ban on new coal fired power stations, full participation by all nations, reset country goals and monitor and reduce methane emissions. Now, this is very similar to the sustainable development scenario proposed by the IEA. And you can see from the chart on your lower left what this will do with regard to your fossil fuel demand, where oil and coal will dramatically drop and gas, at least through 2040, will, will fill in a, um, a gap. And this actually is the way to go to your two degree um, temperature increase limitation, which will likely avoid your tipping point. So in conclusion then, while COVID-19 pandemic and climate change are separate crises, there are key lessons that can apply to both as well as to energy future. First of all, the pandemic has demonstrated the fragility of the world economic order and the potential of global natural calamities for disruption. The second point is the economic pain that's associated with an 8% drop in global CO2 emissions is now, is now clear and the question is, are nations willing to accept continued near-term economic stress for longer-term environmental gains? And the third point is that when energy use has dropped, it's been the higher greenhouse gas fossil fuels, coal and oil that have borne most of the decline. And the question is, is this a temporary phenomenon or is this a long-term shift in energy patterns? And these are questions which the next year or two will answer. So we truly are at a true, um, a, a true tipping point or change point and how we react will go a long way toward determining um, our energy future and the future of the climate, of, of the planet.
So thank you very much for your attention. And I hope this has given you something to think about. Thank you. Um, I also would like to mention that um, I'm very happy to give you this, um, uh, this presentation um, and um, we'll, be, um, we'll be delighted if you send to my email um, and I'll, I'll put it back on the initial slide. Um, I can, can send that to you um, so that you can take a look at the presentation in, in detail. So thank you very much. Uh, Dear Ray, uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I think uh, a lot of uh, materials which we will have to analyze, and, and uh, I think uh, we are planning to, to have a discussion session uh, based on, on, on the materials you presented uh, during the next 10 days, and uh, I will send uh, information to, to all participants and to our contacts uh, because I think this is really important subject and, and a lot of uh, practical steps we need to plan. Uh, so uh, we now have already uh, other specialists and speakers and we will have uh, in-depth discussion for our strategy and actions required for, uh, required to, to, to control uh, this uh, processes which are going in, in the energy sector after COVID-19. Uh, thank you for your participation, dear participants, uh, and uh, see you very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>